Thank you, Brother Rick. Appreciate the choir singing this morning. Y'all did a good job and appreciate your presence here this morning as well. Uh, you've got a Bible with you. Turn that to uh, Genesis chapter number 7. Blake, if you would turn that down just a little bit. I had a couple of, or I had some folks say it was a little loud last week. Got a brand new mic, so trying to adjust that just a little bit. I tend to yell anyway. Apologize for that. Uh, sometimes I get a little excited. Uh, Genesis chapter number 7, appreciate all of you that uh, went on the trip with us uh, up to the ark, had a great time, and if you've not had a chance to do that, uh, we would encourage you to go there for a visit. I think uh, uh, everybody probably that went with us would encourage you to go. It was definitely worth the trip, it was definitely uh, worth the expense, that's something that you ought to see. Uh, the ride back, uh, not so much is good, but... But uh, it, it was okay. It was, uh, it was quite an experience. We had several folks wind up sick. Uh, I don't think it was a result of my driving. However, I may be wrong. Uh, but uh, I believe it was something, maybe some virus or something. I think we wound up now with about 12 that are sick. Uh, even some after I stopped driving have gotten sick. So uh, you, you pray for those folks. But uh, I want to encourage you to go and visit the ark if you get the opportunity. Uh, you'll, you'll, you'll greatly enjoy that. Uh, we're reading this morning out of Genesis chapter number 7. Go ahead and stand with me. We'll read um, maybe the first uh, 16 verses, I believe, this morning. The Word of God says, And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark. For thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens the male and his female, and of beasts that are not clean by two the male and his female. Of fowls also of the air by sevens the male and the female to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. For yet seven days and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. And Noah did according to all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was six hundred years old when the flood of waters, uh, when the flood of waters was upon the earth. And Noah went in, and his sons and his wife and his sons' wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls of everything that creepeth upon the earth. There went in two and two to Noah into the ark, the male and the female, as God had commanded Noah. And it came to pass <clears throat> that after seven days the waters of the flood were upon the earth. And in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, the same day were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth forty days and forty nights. In the self same day entered Noah and Shem and Ham and Japheth and the, son, the sons of Noah and Noah's wife and, three, uh, and the three wives of his sons with him into the ark. They and every beast after his kind, and all the cattle after their kind, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth after his kind, and every fowl after his kind, every bird of every soul. And they went in unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And them that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him. Now I want you to pay particular attention to this next little phrase. And the Lord shut him in. And the Lord shut him in. Father, it is good to be here amongst your people this morning. God, I appreciate so much this opportunity, this privilege that you've given us to, to worship you this morning, to lift up the name of Jesus. And 
God, you've given us breath in our lungs. You've given us strength in our, in our bodies that we can proclaim your goodness. And Father, I pray that uh, while we're here, and Lord, not only while we're here, but every minute of every day of our lives that we might spend giving glory to Jesus. Certainly, you're worthy of our praise, Lord. I pray today for those who are sick. You know who they are. Some are very sick. God, I pray that you'd help them. There are some that's lost loved ones that continue to deal with bereavement. God, we pray that you would provide encouragement for them. There may be some here today that's walking through the valley. It's in need of a word of encouragement. God, I'm aware that as we're attentive to your word, that you're able to speak to every heart in attendance. And I pray that you would do just that. I don't know every need, but surely you do, Lord. I pray that you'd speak this morning and encourage each one in the building. God, I pray that if there's a lost person under the sound of my voice, Father, that they may turn to you in forgiveness, Lord, and understand that Jesus has paid the penalty for their sin. God, I pray they might pass from death unto life in our presence. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. I want to preach for just a few minutes on this time, on this topic. When God shuts the door. When God shuts the door. I've read through this scripture a great many times, and maybe uh, you might be quite familiar with uh, with the story of the flood. We call it Noah's flood, but it was not Noah's flood. It was God's flood. It was God's way of bringing uh, uh, God's way of bringing judgment upon the earth. And it's not just a myth. It's not just a, a story. It's not just a fantasy. The fact is, it's a reality. There was a flood over all the earth and there is a great deal of evidence that backs up what the Bible says. However, there are a great uh, number of folks that would like to dispute that and, and offer maybe some, uh, uh, maybe some other kind of thinking uh, uh, along that lines. But we understand that the Bible is true today. Now, uh, we did get the opportunity to go, uh, to go up to Kentucky. I think it's called Williamstown. Uh, the little town there where the ark is and uh, it really brings to life the story uh, of the ark, the story of God's destruction and at the same time God's deliverance and a great picture is painted for you and I and certainly we understand that there are a lot of parallels between that ark and the Lord Jesus Christ. We know uh, that Noah and his family some eight souls were saved on that ark and we know that as, as many that that, that that get into Christ, that are in Christ, shall be saved from the wrath to come. We thank we thank God for that. But we uh, we think about that, and I want to share with you uh, here just a little bit from the Scripture uh, this morning. I want to share very briefly four ideas that I got from this Scripture as I read through it, or, or maybe uh, uh, maybe four points that you could pull out. But uh, but number one. I want you to notice, and, and I want you to go back to, to verse number one right there. And, and something gripped me when I began to read that. And I wonder if you've ever noticed this. This is a, a common theme throughout the Bible. We see this repeatedly. Uh, but let's see it again in verse number one. The Bible says, And the Lord said to Noah, Come thou and all thy house into the ark, for I have what? Seen thee. He said, I have seen the righteous. Now, I, I, I want to share with you uh, this first point is, uh, you, you see the gaze of the Lord. This first idea is that nothing escapes the gaze of the Lord. God notices every little thing. He knows my heart. He knows your heart. Certainly he knew the wickedness of the people that lived in Noah's time and certainly he understood the way that Noah lived. Now we'll uh, maybe elaborate on that in a minute but the Bible says there, I have seen the righteous. That's, that's what he said about Noah. Now let me 
just uh, maybe differentiate just, just a little bit. You may be thinking that, that Noah was a good man and that he was worthy of God's deliverance, but that's not exactly what the Scripture is saying. Now, uh, we tend to think about righteousness uh, maybe as, as kind of a form of self-righteousness, but the truth is Noah had no righteousness of his own. There, uh, the, the fact that, that Noah did anything good it is not because he was righteous, but it was because he was accounted righteous because he had faith to believe in God. He, he had exercised faith, and the righteousness that you saw him live out in his life, it was just a testimony to what he believed. Now, if you look around, maybe, and you find Christians in this room, some of which, maybe many of which, live a very godly life, live in a very godly manner. Listen, it's not their, it's not their goodness, it's not their own righteousness that's going to get them into heaven. That, that's not something they can present before God as a medal and say, look, uh, I've, I've been good. The truth is, the reason that you see them living right in this world is that God is already alive in their heart and there's nothing uh, to brag about. But Noah's righteousness was just just indicative of the faith that he lived out. So it indicated that he had faith in the Lord. So uh, we see his gaze. He, he saw not only the righteousness of Noah there, if you'll back up into uh, chapter number 6 and Verse number nine, it said, these are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generations. And, and, and what does it say there next? And Noah walked with God. He, he walked with God. He was close to God. So basically I think where you could kind of wrap up what we're saying here by saying this, Noah was a spiritually mature man. He, he was a man that followed God. He, he walked the walk. His brother uh, Randy Roberts would say he let his walkie walkie match his talkie talkie. You, you could tell that he was a Christian by the way that he behaved. Now not only, uh, you, you see his life stood in stark contrast to the rest of the world that he lived in. Now, I, wanna, I want you to understand that he lived in a very wicked time. You and I live in a very wicked time as well. And I wonder if our life sticks out as a contrast as much as, as Noah did. I wonder, you see, God saw the, the righteousness of Noah. Not only that, but you notice that God saw uh, the, the rottenness of of mankind. He saw the righteousness of Noah, but his gaze also fell upon the rottenness of mankind. He understood that there was nothing good about man. If you'll back up there to verse number five in chapter number six, the Bible says there, and God saw the, the wickedness of man was, was great in the earth and that every imagination of his thoughts or of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That, that means that, that all, uh, it, that it seems that, that all of mankind except for Noah and his house, it seems like they ran to wickedness, that wickedness characterized their life. They, they were in some kind, uh, some kind of sin at all points in their life. They were very wicked people. Now, we live in a time like that where people are, are consumed with wickedness. Would you agree with me on that? We watched one uh, little clip, Brother Tyler, you may have seen that, uh, where they were supposedly uh, interviewing Noah there, and, and one of the, the, I think the person that was supposed to be transcribing the, uh, the, the encounter between a reporter and Noah, they were asking questions and, and Noah was talking about sin and the guy that was transcribing, he, he got very irritated with Noah and he stood up and he said, look, what you call sin, he said, I call it freedom. And I thought about that a lot and we live in that world today. What the Bible says is sin, the world that we live in 
characterizes it as freedom. I have the freedom to do as I wish. I can do whatever I want, but the Bible still calls it sin. You see, he lived in a very wicked time. There, there was uh, uh, the people pursued nothing but wickedness. There, there would have been uh, uh, idolatry running rampant, much like it is today. Uh, drunkenness, sexual immorality, so many things that uh, that were going on in that culture. You see, none of those escape the gaze of the Lord. And there, there's nothing that you do that will escape the gaze of the Lord either. Nothing that I do will escape the gaze of the Lord. You see, we can hide some of our, uh, some of our less desirable attributes from, from our fellow Christians. We may even hide them from our family. But you see, God looks not as man looks. God looks on the heart and He knows the wickedness uh, with which we, we live, uh, that, that is inside of us. God knows what we do in the dark when no one else is around. You see the gaze of the Lord there? Not only that, but I, I, I want to take you back to chapter number 6, and I want to show you here, and we kind of consider all this as a whole, these differing, uh, the, some, some different ideas presented in chapter 6 and 7. Some of the things that are said in chapter 6 and 7 are restated, some of them uh, multiple times. Now, uh, look with me back. Turn back to chapter number 6 and look at verse number 6. And you, you find not only the gaze of the Lord, but you find the grief of the Lord. You see, when God saw the, the wickedness of man, it grieved God at his heart. It grieved God. What man had decided to do broke the heart of God. You know, when you and I choose to sin, we really break the heart of God. We, we hurt the heart of God when we... Ch and there's not a person in this room. Listen, none of us are innocent. We, we've all chosen to sin at some point in our life. I have. You have. Knowingly done something that we know that we shouldn't have been doing. And it breaks a heart of God when that happens. Look at verse number 6. It says, It repented the Lord that He had made man on the earth, and it grieved Him. That, that, that literally means that it hurt Him at His heart, that, that He had made man. It, it repented Him. He, 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 you know, and that idea brings a connotation of He, he kind of changed His thinking. Maybe, maybe He regretted somewhat that He had even made man because man had hurt His heart so much. May I don't know, sometimes maybe uh, you find something similar to that in the life of a parent and a child. Sometimes a child will go astray and rebel against everything that he's ever been taught. And sometimes maybe, and I know we don't say this, but sometimes a parent may think, well, I may have been better off. We may have been better off. I've never even had any kids. Sometimes that, that may go through our heart when we're hurt that much. Maybe, uh, maybe we shouldn't have done this Maybe I shouldn't be a parent. You see, God's heart is hurt, uh, and it's kind of like that. I don't think that we can understand completely, but it grieves the heart of God. Why does it grieve the heart of God? Well, when God put Adam and Eve in the garden, He intended for them to have fellowship with Him. Do you believe that? God intended for them to be able to have fellowship with Him. In fact, he, the Bible says He came into the garden in the cool of the evening and He walked with Adam, right? He would stroll with Him there over the garden and they had fellowship. They had a good relationship together until Adam and Eve chose to sin and then that sin threw up a roadblock between them and God. You see, it was their own idea to rebel against God. It wasn't anything that God had done, but, but it was them. You see, it grieved the heart of God. God had planned on them being perfect. He had planned on them being pure. Purity is God's plan. Listen, young folks, old folks, purity, God expects purity from His people. Yeah, the Bible says, and, and I think it's uh, uh, 1 Peter 1, 16, that we should be holy. Why? For He is holy. We're, God expects us to be holy. We should be a holy people. You see, uh, there that it grieves the heart of God when we choose 
to reject God. That's what Adam and Eve did. They chose to reject God there in the Garden of Eden. We, we know when, when, when Eve took of that forbidden fruit and she knew that God had said not to do that and when she gave it to Adam, Adam understood that God had said not to do that and they knowingly and willingly took that fruit, rebelled against God, rejected His plan for their life. He reject, they rejected Purity. Now, you see, uh, sin grieves the heart of God. Not only that, but sin grieves the heart of the godly. Does sin grieve your heart when you sin against God and you realize that? Let me ask you this. Does it hurt you? Does it bother you? That, that's one good... Uh, I, I really think that that's a good litmus test of, 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 of our salvation. You know, I've had a lot of people say, well, preacher, I just, I just don't have this confirmation. I'm just not sure if I'm saved. I'm not for sure. Well, ask yourself this question. When you sin, and you know you do, can you feel good about that and be okay in it? Or does God take you to the woodshed and make you wish you'd never done that? Listen, if God takes you to the woodshed and you wished you'd never done that, that's a pretty good bet that, that you're a born-again Christian because God doesn't chasten children that don't belong to Him, does He? He chastens His own. And I, I thank God, I don't know about you, but I thank God for that, for, for, for that chastening. And I thank God for that conviction when we do something wrong because that lets us know that we belong to God. Now, you see, if, if sin grieves the heart of God, it it ought to grieve the heart of the godly. It ought to grieve the heart of a godly man. I believe that it did Paul. I, 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 in fact, uh, uh, he said in the scriptures, he, he, he called himself a, a, a wretched man. We, we understand that. Now, he said in Romans chapter number 7, he said, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For the will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would, I, I, the evil which I would not, that I do. Have you ever felt like that? Sometimes you just we, we do the things that we know we shouldn't and then we wind up not doing the things that we know we should. And he goes on to say, I find then a, a, a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me, for I delight in the law of God after my inward man. And that I think that's a testimony to your salvation. If you delight in the law of God after your inward man, that's a that, you know, that's a pretty good proof that you're born again. Now, he says, but I see another law in my members. In other words, we're still dealing with this flesh. He said, I, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then he said, and Paul said this, and I, I think about my sin and I think about Paul and I think, well, Paul's way up here and I'm way down here and that's, that's so, but Paul, listen, Paul didn't say it like that. He saw Jesus way up here and he understood his helplessness. He understood and, and he went on to say this. He said, oh wretched man that I am. He saw himself as an old wretch that was in need. He said, who should deliver me from the body of this death? He said, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. He, he says, so then with the mind of myself serve the, the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. You see, the grief of the Lord here, it, it grieves the heart of God, grieves the heart of the godly. Not only that, but you find uh, uh, verse number four. Look back at chapter number seven, and we'll, we'll read verse number four. You find the guarantee here of the Lord. Now, uh, it, it says, verse number four, for yet seven days and I'll cause it to rain upon the earth. Forty days and forty nights and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. You find here the guarantee of the Lord. Now listen, one thing that you have to know, God is a God of love. That's, that's a fact. That's true. But God is as much a God of judgment is He is love. In fact, the two go hand in hand. If God didn't, listen, if God didn't care, He wouldn't bother with judgment. God judges sin because He loves. And you see, that's as much a part of God. And you don't, folks don't want to hear much about this today. The judgment of God. 
You know, and people say, well, how would a loving God? I've heard people say this. You know, there's only a certain percentage of the world that's Christians. How could a loving God send, send all those people to hell? How could a loving God do that? Listen, I want to tell you, friends, now you may not know how to, quite how to take this. There are estimates that there were somewhere around 8 billion people living on planet earth at the time of this flood. Now there's some varying degree of numbers, but certainly the earth was very heavily populated by this time. And when, when the flood came along, there had been some number of years, if I understand correctly, there were a great number of people, and God sent them every one to their death except for eight. Because they were the only ones that, that seemed to seek after God. Listen, their, their, their faith was right in the sight of God. You see, God must judge sin. And once, once that door was shut, that's when the judgment came. And the judgment came swiftly. Now, we live in a time much like that today. The Bible says that in Noah's time, they were eating and drinking, and they were married and giving in marriage right to the time that the flood came and swept them all away. We we're, we're talking about that, that ark, and we were sitting around there looking, at it, I think, on the outside, and 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 I, I told the uh, I told the ladies, I said, can you imagine all those folks over the time that Noah was working on that ark? They just drove by there and laughed at him. And they, and they said, how'd they drive by? Well, they drove by on camels, I reckon, didn't they? And they, 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 can you imagine him building that ark out here on a high hill and everybody knowing what he was doing and laughing at him the whole time and him preaching the whole time, listen, you need to get in this ark because a flood is coming and they had no idea what a flood was. Why in the world are you making a ship that big and it's nowhere near the water? So he must have been the, the laughing stock of everybody, but he was telling them that that judgment is coming and your message and my message is the judgment is coming you better get in Jesus today you better put your faith and trust in Christ just like Noah and his sons and their wives did they got in the ark they trusted the ark to deliver them because that's what God said listen if you want to be saved you've got to get in Jesus he shed his blood that you can have life and the only way to be saved is by putting your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and that may sound wrong to the rest of the world listen it may seem like a lot of people's going, going to be destroyed but that's the truth listen if you don't know Christ then you're going to have a, a rude awakening when the door is shut and you can't get in anymore when the rain started and the flood started to rise can you imagine the people that must have been wanting to get on that ark then but it was too late because God himself had shut the door now today there's an open door. I don't know about tomorrow. If God's been a dealing with your heart, then you need to get in the ark today. You need to know Christ today. You need not wait any longer. The flood may be coming and it might be this afternoon. The Bible says the self same day that they went in and God shut the door that the flood came and took them away. The rain come, the, 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 the earth opened up and, and all the depths started coming up and listen, the, the judgment came and they were gone. Judgment is coming. It's a fact. Do you know Jesus is your Savior? You see, this may seem harsh for God to do that. But right in the middle of that, you find a great picture of the love of God. The Bible says that Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Listen, friend. If you're sitting here today, and you don't know Jesus, and He's whispering to your heart that you need to get in before it's too late. You've got time to receive that grace. What a beautiful picture that God has painted for us with this ark. Do you know Jesus as your Savior? The door's still open today. I can't promise you how much longer the door's going to be open. But I can promise you this. When God shuts the door, there's no hope for you. There's no hope left. If God's dealing with your heart, the Bible says that today is the accepted time. Today is the day of salvation. 
If you don't know Jesus, you need to get in today.